Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the University of Iowa Special Collections Summer Seminar Series. My name is Lindsay Mowen, and I'm the Public Services Librarian at the Special Collections and University Archives. Today, I'm going to be talking about my favorite item in our department, our privately printed edition of The Tale of Peter Rabbit. So as is evident by the materials behind me, I am a collector of Beatrix Potter materials. I focus on Peter Rabbit, but I definitely will collect anything related to Beatrix Potter or the rest of her works. So I'm coming to you today from my Peter Rabbit room, which as it sounds, is an entire room in my house dedicated to my collection. So there's a lot more that you're not seeing here today that I own. So let's begin today with a brief introduction on the woman behind the beloved's children's tale, Beatrix Potter. Although she went by Beatrix, Beatrix was named Helen after her mother. She was born on July 28, 1866, to a well-off family that made their money from cotton trade in the north of England. While Beatrix did grow up financially comfortable, she and her brother Bertram were actually fairly isolated as children and spent most of their time at home in the schoolroom. Um, and when Beatrix showed some promise in the arts, her education became focused on painting and drawing, which would later benefit her career as an author and an illustrator. So while today we will be focusing on Beatrix as the creator of the famous tale of Peter Rabbit, it would not do her memory justice to omit briefly mentioning the other roles that she played. She was an amateur mycologist, which is the study of mushrooms. She was also a farmer, a sheep breeder, and an environmentalist. And she actually donated 4,000 acres of land to the National Trust after her death in 1943. So where did the tale, tale of Peter Rabbit come from? For the purposes of this presentation, I will give a very short version of how the famous tale came to be. So in September 1893, Beatrix wrote a letter to five-year-old Noel Moore, who was the child of one of her governesses. Noel was ill, and Beatrix sent him a letter to cheer him up. Um, and this letter actually would be the later inspiration for the tale of Peter Rabbit. So on this slide, you see part of that letter which begins, my dear Noel, I do not know what to write to you. So I shall tell you a story about four little rabbits whose names are Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. So seven years later, Noel actually still had those letters among with many other, they corresponded a long time. Um, and Beatrix is actually able to borrow those letters back and use them to help her create her first children's book, The Tale of Peter Rabbit. So even though she had this wonderful idea already laid out and she had the, the drawing and um, watercolor skills to make a really great children's book, the publication of the story was proving it was not going to be easy. So what she had originally titled, The Tale of Peter Rabbit and Mr. McGregor's Garden, Beatrix was turned down by at least six publishers that we know of, including Frederick Warren and Company, who would originally publish all of her works and are actually still publishing um, her works under the parent company, Penguin Random House Books. So reasons for not publishing her books range from it being too long, too small, it wouldn't sell, things like that. So Beatrix actually, she wanted to keep the cost down so more children would enjoy this book. Um, and therefore she wanted the illustrations to be in black and white, like you see in this slide here. Um, the two illustrations are actually from Iowa's copy and I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, she was also reluctant to have images cut from her book. Um, she liked all the images and wanted to keep them all in, while publishers, again, going back to the complaint that the book was too long, wanted to keep it trim. So these images, as I just was talking about, are examples that are in the privately printed edition and that were later cut from commercial. So, we, for example, we have the rabbit smoking tobacco. Publishers felt, even at that time, that tobacco was not an appropriate um, subject for children's books, so that was cut. And then we've got this woman with a pie down below, and in the story, Peter's father um, was actually killed by Mr. McGregor and put in a pie and served to him by his wife. So again, that was thought to be a little graphic for children's books, so it was, was cut out as well. But it appears in the privately printed version, and these are copies from Iowa. So it is also my assumption in my research, um, and just from what I know today, that Beatrix being an unwed young woman was also probably an obstacle in her ability to convince publishers to do things her way. 
Um, she had to use her father's influence a lot just to even get a conversation with some of these folks. Um, and she had to have a chaperone and things like that. So I'm sure that was an obstacle. Um, and so keeping all of that in mind, she decided that she was going to make the decision to have the story printed independently using her own money. Um, therefore resulted in the privately printed edition of the Taylor Peter Abbott, not the first edition. And so on December 16th, 1901, Beatrix had 250 copies of the now named The Tale of Peter Rabbit printed by Strange Ways and Sons. She mainly gave these copies away to friends and family, and there's even evidence that a copy went to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, um, and he had high praise for the book. So here you can see in this slide, um, there's one of those editions, one of those 250, marked working copy. This is at the Victoria and Alberts Museum. Um, the, the, her book was a success and it definitely um, got the attention of Frederick Warren and Company and they agreed to publish it with some minor changes um, and they used the privately printed one as um, inspiration for the first edition. So now that you know a very, very brief history of this important printing, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the copy at the University of Iowa. So this copy was donated by James M. and Christine Wallace of Pennsylvania. They donated a very large and impressive um, donation of children's books, 238 titles, and that included many first editions, um, including a first edition, first issue of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, a first edition of Wind in the Willows, and a full beautiful set of Andrew Lang fairy books. Another popular item that can be found in this collection is a 1879 copy of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland with an original John Tenniel illustration tipped in. And those are all still at special collections that can be visited. And so half of this, it, it was appraised, and then half of this donation arrived to Iowa in October 1978. And the other half arrived in January 1979. However, we're not sure which set the Peter Rabbit book was in. So at the latest, it, its arrival was January 1979. So here's the grand reveal of Iowa's copy. Um, these are photos that I took of the book. And definitely know that these photos do not do this copy justice. But do take my word for it that the condition is amazing, especially for a children's book in such a thin binding. So in here, I am holding one of my facsimiles. I have many. I'm sure that's of no surprise. Um, but you can just see how thin that spine is. It is a very thin and fragile book. Um, you know, most copies probably didn't make it just from overhandling. And you can even see that our copy in the spine there, there's a crease just from opening and closing it, um, even though the copy is amazing. This 14 centimeter book is definitely something that I'm just shocked at how good our, our copy is as far as condition. Um, one thing to note, you can visit this book when, when, when we are open. However, we don't allow handling as far as opening and closing the book because we want to keep the integrity of the object. Um, we do have many fac facsimiles that you can see, and it's also fully digitized, which I'll talk about later. Um, but we will bring it out for folks to see because even being in the presence of the book is very impressive. So let's talk a little bit about the documents that accompany our book. So this slide contains text that I copied word for word from the appraisals note, the appraiser note. Um, so here we have that text. It states that there is no publisher, no date, and that the first printing of this edition was 250 copies, 200 with the flat backs, like the copy at Iowa, and 50 with round. This is actually inaccurate. Um, the appraiser was incorrect. Beatrix's first printing of the softbacks was in fact 250 printings. And then she later had a second impression of this book made two months later in February 1902 of 200 copies in that stronger rounded binding. So that's a little bit of an inaccuracy um, that was appraised um, of the original donor who donated it to Iowa. And this isn't the only kind of confusing, misleading um, thing that can be found when researching Iowa's copy. So we have that appraiser note, and then we also have this document here, which accompanies our book. Um, it is a letter from the bookseller that sold it to James Wallace, who eventually donated it to Iowa. Um, here we have um, Charles Sessler is the bookseller, and Maybelle Zahn was the employee who sold it to James Wallace, and she prepared this letter. So along with that confusing um, print inaccuracy that I mentioned before, 
This letter confusingly states that, quote, the actual date of this issue was 1901, although from records of the author, it has been determined that this book was actually printed in 1900. The fact that it was issued in December 1901 is proved by the author's own assertion and confirmed by the two presentation copies, both which are dated Christmas 1901, end quote. So the mentioning of it being actually printed in 1900 is a little bit confusing, even though they still state that it was then proved 1901. So if you're just skimming the letter, you're kind of like, well, which date is it? And I have a feeling that this confusing nature of this statement may have contributed to a date error that's on the spine of the cloth slipcase that accompanies Iowa's copy. Um, you can see the slipcase lovely green box that accompanies our book here. And I assume that James Wallace, the donor, had this slipcase commissioned after purchasing it from Charles Sessler Booksellers, as there is no mention of this box um, in the bookseller's letters, but there is in the appraisal note that was given with the donation to Iowa. And I have a feeling that there, that error alluded to the 1900 date that is on the slip, the slipcase of this box here. So when I first encountered our book, I was like, 1900, that's amazing. And then, then yeah, further research, I realized that was an error. And now I can kind of know, I kind of know why. So while that bookseller's letter did have some inaccuracies and confusing, confusing text, one part of the letter that I hope is not an error is the section where Zahn mentions that she, quote, purchased it from an agent who bought it from the niece of Beatrix Potter. And if this is true, the niece would have been on Beatrix's husband's side. Her husband was William Helis. Um, Beatrix and her brother Bertram did not have children, but William was one of 11 children. And therefore, there were a number of nieces that could have been who the bookseller was referring to. So another thing, another interesting piece of ephemera that accompanies Iowa's copy is this little note. It's just about this big, and um, it also kind of reinforces that 1900 and 1901 date confusion. However, um, it does claim that it's from the author's own collection, which to me was very exciting when I first read that. However, as a good librarian, I wanted some proof that, uh, to the statement's accuracy, and I wanted documentation. I wanted more. So therefore, that led me to pursue some research at the Historical Society of Philadelphia earlier this year. So the Historical Society of Philadelphia holds the Charles Sessler's papers, which again was the bookseller's company who sold Wallace his copy of the privately printed tale of Peter Rabbit. So here in the slide, we have the beautiful reading room, which was amazing to visit. Highly recommend it when we can all travel again. Um, and we also have a screenshot of the Charles Sessler finding aid, which I had to use in order to dig through the collection. So earlier this year in January 2020, my husband and I traveled to Philadelphia, where I attended the annual ALA Midwinter Library Conference. So during this trip, we traveled to the Historical Society to try to fill in the blanks of exactly who owned the copy between its printing and its arrival to Iowa. So I wanted proof that Beatrix Potter and then later one of her nieces were long-term owners of this, um, of this copy before selling it to this mysterious unknown agent. And then if possible, I wanted to know um, who that agent was, how much it was purchased for, when it was purchased, things like that. So here, you have, uh, here I have a timeline that I've kind of outlined with some gaps and I wanted to fill. So we have the original printing, which I discussed, which was done in December 1901. Um, and then it was, all of the books were actually given to Beatrix to distribute as she saw fit to friends and family, so technically she was a previous owner. And then if we go along with, with everything we've learned today, um, if she had it before her niece, we can assume that she would have had it in her possession for possibly 13 years, because she didn't marry William Helis until 1913. Um, and so then at some point after that, she would have given it to one of her nieces, and then the niece perhaps sold it or gave it to this unknown agent, who then later sold it to Charles Sessler's Incorporated, possibly anywhere from 1947 to 1948. The Sessler letter is dated September 1948, so we can kind of assume based on how long things took then, we give it about a year grace period, that kind of thing. And then Charles Sessler sold it to James Wallace in 1948, which eventually was then given to Iowa in 78 or 79. So as a special collections librarian, I am no stranger to finding aids, especially collections that are large and mainly unprocessed or unorganized or unorganized 
um, organize just a little bit. It makes it difficult to find things sometimes. We have so many boxes that you can't just, as a patron, browse through freely. Um, I'm usually helping researchers navigate these complicated collections rather than being on the other side. So as you can see from this screenshot, which is only a small portion of that finding aid, this was not going to be an easy task. So with my husband's help, we narrowed our scope to looking for records before the date of that Cecil's letter, so before September 1948. And we focused on bills and receipts, purchase records, and we focused on foreign purchases, assuming that the unknown agent was either in the UK or was purchasing it from somebody in the UK, Beatrix Potter's niece. So as you can see in this red circle, there were 123 unprocessed boxes of bills. So we avoided those. Um, and since we only had a few hours to research, we focused our efforts on foreign ledgers and cash receipts in hopes that we'd find mention of this copy of the tale of Peter Rabbit. However, like many research endeavors, finding the specific evidence we were looking for was just not meant to be at that time. After a few hours and many boxes and ledgers later, we realized that the majority of the records of the Charles Sussler papers were primarily accountant records. So in this image, you see dates with accounting related totals, costs of on-hand inventories and inventory costs. And another common type of record that we would find is like what you see in this picture. There were a lot of foreign purchase ledgers for us to go through. So this particular page is dated June 1948. So a few months before that bookseller's record that accompanies the book. Um, and they kept track of who they bought the item from, the purchase date, what the cost was, and the type of item, and sometimes even like, was it a painting, uh, was it autographed, though, is it rare, those kinds of things, but they didn't name what the item actually was. So that was a bit of a pickle. Um, therefore, it kind of ended our research at that time as there was no way for us to figure out which one of these was the tail of Peter Rabbit by looking through these records. And I suppose that one could investigate each of those booksellers and see um, if they have their own records and investigate further using the timeline that I've outlined today, but that amount of work would entail, I mean, it just seemed overwhelming to me. So for right now, I feel it best to let the thought of Beatrix owning this book for about 13 years and then her niece as the previous owners remaining what we assume and kind of adding to the magic of the item. So now here is a cover that many of you may find more familiar. So after the success of the privately printed Tale of Peter Rabbit, in 1902, Frederick Warren and Company printed the first commercial edition of the Tale of Peter Rabbit. And the cover remains primarily unchanged throughout the years. We see minor changes to the binding, called the color um, of, the, of, the, of the outside around Peter, but the iconic image of him and the text, the font, really does remain the same today. Um, it is also of interest to note that in the United States, um, after this book was um, published, Frederick Born and Company failed to register proper copyright to the tale of Peter Rabbit, therefore making it legal for American publishers to create their own version of Peter Rabbit, um, sort of like legal bootlegs, as I like to call them. So it's not hard to find copies of these unauthorized editions. There's at least 300 known versions of American versions of the tale of Peter Rabbit and a lot of folks can find them at um, antique stores or perhaps a grandparents book collection or basement thinking they have a rare valuable version of the tale of Peter Rabbit but unless it's that very first version of the American bootleg it's probably not going to have a very high value but it's really interesting however the American illustrations um, and watercolors do not do not match up to Beatrix's originals. So in more recent years, Frederick Warren and Company um, had explored, make, they've explored making all these special editions, um, which have these really wonderful, fun, and unique bindings, um, which I really enjoy as a collector. And you can see here, these right here are all different versions of the tale of Peter Rabbit. Um, and I just like to keep them all separate. And I just think it makes for a really striking visual. Um, and the inside of these texts are actually unchanged. They match the original. Uh, but the outside, they really, they take some liberties, which is pretty fun. I always look forward to seeing what the next special edition is going to look like. Um, in these newer editions, too, they actually re-added the images that were cut from that first edition. Um, and they even included images that were never used at all, that were on the cutting room floor. Uh, and they actually, these new editions also have a higher quality of printing. 
1987, they took brand new photos of all of Beatrix Potter's original illustrations to make the new authorized version of the tale of Peter Rabbit. So any that you buy today are going to have a much striking, the vibrant color rather than one that might be from the 70s or something like that. So um, just kind of a neat little bit of Peter Rabbit history. So in closing, the worldwide impact of Beatrix Potter, the tale of Peter Rabbit, cannot be ignored. I really struggle to find a person who has not read this charming tale as a child. Um, it's printed in 36 languages and it sells about 2 million copies each year. And Peter and his friends who appear in Beatrix Potter's other 22 children's books are definitely a, definitely a global phenomenon that make up the world of Beatrix Potter. And you can actually take a look at our copy now. It is digitized and online. Do you have a URL down there? It might be kind of hard to read, but again, this will be recorded and put on YouTube later. Um, it's fully digitized. It's got kind of a fun interactive interface where you can flip through the pages and it's actually text searchable. Um, this is a great resource to have since we don't really allow people to really open and close it. This way it gives that access that I think is important for people to have. Um, and I just wanted to thank everybody for listening today. And I wanted to quickly touch on some of our other uh, Beatrix Potter highlights in Iowa. Obviously the must have for any collector is the privately printed one. You can't really beat that. But we do have some other great resources at Iowa, including um, a family cookbook from Beatrix Potter's husband, William Helis. I haven't done a lot of investigation, but I don't believe Beatrix has written inside this book. Um, it might predate her but that's a pretty cool um, extra little bit of Beatrix Potter history that we have at Iowa. We have a brand, uh, very recently purchased actually, first trade edition, first impression of the Taylor of Gloucester. Um, that's on its way, so we're very excited for that. And we've got a couple of um, early editions, one that's dated at least 1918 due to the papers. We're not quite sure what the date is. It's very difficult to date your Peter Rabbit copies, um, but we've got some other fun editions and things like that. So if you want to learn more about uh, our copy or Peter Rabbit or just what the University of Iowa Special Collections has, feel free to reach out to us. Our website's listed here along with an email that is regularly uh, monitored and we'll be happy to get back to you. Here are some sources and thanks so much for listening. I'm happy to take some questions. <laughs>